then we will this and this. Menu right here. Nine, nine people, so it's like, Yo, who? It's like nine people, so. Yeah. So there is room for more people if more people want to come in person, but uh, whatever makes you happy is fine with me. Uh, let's see, where did we? leave off okay so we talked about uh um did we look at hello world and see did we write that no so okay so we were kind of i was on this slide but we were kind of bouncing around with some different ideas i talked about nbc at all yet in here so me okay um all right so let, let's just kind of start talking and then maybe i'll bump into some memories that tell me where i left off um, so we were looking at the evolution of our languages and really we're, we're, uh, talking about, uh, well, this is 300, right? We're in the right, that's the right class. <laughs> right, the right class. All right. So, um, and really we want to focus on the idea that programming is the skill set. The language doesn't matter. So one of the things I like to do is keep bouncing back and forth between different languages and also different operating systems so that you don't get too comfortable in a single thing just as computer science majors, we should be experts at the, the across the board with technology, you know, we, we should be able to walk into Best Buy and not get taken advantage of and that kind of stuff. So as we see kind of our languages in here, we're focusing on C++, which we're going to call our first popular object oriented language, which is not necessarily uh, um, uh, It's not the first object oriented language, but remind me what what's the difference between a procedural language and an object oriented language. What does it mean for a language to be object oriented. is we would call this guy here, C is a procedural language. Where C++ is object oriented, as is Java, as is C sharp, as is Objective C, as is Swift. So all of our modern languages are object oriented. Okay. Yep. The, the example I used in class when I first introduced this, uh, probably in uh, 200, was the idea of the procedural versus the object oriented telephone. Right? I mentioned that there's like this big pile of wires up here. And so if there's a big pile of wires and I tell you that, oh, this is a telephone, and well, some of you don't believe me at first. And um, you know, then you come up and you find some of the parts of a telephone and you hear a, 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 you know, a dial tone, not that those happen anymore. Um, but ultimately you're convinced that, oh, of course that is a telephone, but it doesn't look like a telephone. So in real life, when we solve problems, again, programming languages, the job is for them to allow us to solve problems in a way that's similar to how we already solve them in real life. Okay. So remember, they're a power tool for us. So we want to change our mindset and look at it as programming is not necessarily difficult. It's already providing us a tool that allows us to talk to a computer as close to our own way of problem solving as possible. So in real life, we think about things in terms of objects. We have a laptop. Now we know that a laptop means a bunch of stuff, right? You know, we have some expectations of the capabilities of a laptop, but if you see, like I, I'm looking around the room, he has a laptop, he has a laptop, he has a laptop. Everybody has laptops in here, right? Um, now, not all of these laptops are the same machine. I don't necessarily know from here what the, how much RAM you have, processors, whatever, but I know all these machines have RAM and I know all these machines have processors. I know they have a screen that you can see. They have a keyboard, all this stuff. There's some expectations about what a laptop object means, but my initial conceptualization of this is that these are laptop objects that are around the room, right? And that has connotations to it. Same thing, smartphone. This thing is a tool that does things. And what do we, when you have a laptop, you have public interfaces, for example, that you interact with the laptop through. So maybe you have an external mouse, you have a trackpad, whatever it is, you have a keyboard. These are the tools that are available to you publicly from that object that allow you to interface with it, even though you know there's some complex stuff, those wires are inside the laptop, okay? Same thing's true for a telephone. 
Okay, we know that all those wires are inside of this uh, phone, right? But we don't have to deal with the wires on a daily basis. We are interacting with this object in terms of the public interfaces that it's made available to us. Okay, right, make some sense? So a procedural programming language, which would have been kind of the, the, pot, the early day programming languages before we started solving much more complex problems with our uh, programming languages, it would have only given us the ability to represent a telephone, for example, as that pile of wires. Okay, they didn't give us the tools to stuff all those wires into a little box and then just punch holes in it for the parts of it that you actually need to work with. An object oriented language at the end of the day really is just a, it gives you one more tool. A lot of times they refer to it as Tupperware. Okay, it gives you a box that you can put all the details in that you do need to write as a programmer, but you don't need to look at when you're actually using the software, right? And poke holes in the box that expose the parts of it that you do need to interface with when you're actually using the software. Okay, so that's what an object oriented language gives us. And the way it delivers that is through classes, like you said. Go ahead. Um, well, uh, in 450 uh, systems programming, we use C. Uh, we write like operating system drivers and things like that. Um, realistically, for the first half of 200, um, and maybe even the the you know maybe the beginning of 250, we 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 pretty much used those object oriented languages from a procedural standpoint. We didn't start writing classes right away, right? So even though Python is a object oriented language and Java is an object oriented language, we were forcing them to work as a procedural. Uh, correct. C does not support classes. C has a um, kind of, let's call it a predecessor to classes called a struct. And if we kind of talk about the, the difference there, so we can say structs in C allows us to create a variable that contains multiple values. So for example, we could do something like um, a struct for a person might have fields, well, they wouldn't be called fields, but might have variables for first name, last name, and age or something like that. All right, and the way that would look in C Struct, well, let it capitalize or whatever. Um, person, char pointer, F name, char pointer. I know it's going <laughs> to do it for me. And then int age, something like that. Um, and then if we wanted to, we can call this guy P1 if we want to go ahead and immediately create a variable of that type. Um, otherwise, we can go like that. Then we can say uh, um, struct person P1, comma P2. And we can say P1 is equal to our P1 dot F name is equal to my something, something like that. All right, so what is a, so if structs are precursors to uh, objects, what are they really missing? What's the main thing that a struct is missing that an object allows us to do, that a class allows us to accomplish? Yeah, no functions. So does not support functions slash methods. Now, there was a hack kind of towards the later years of using uh, C as we started bumping into uh, um, um, 
programs were maybe kind of organizing things in an object oriented ish kind of way maybe started making some sense and what they would do is they would embed pointers to functions inside of a struct where you'd have a function someplace else and you'd have a void pointer which pointed to where that function lived in memory so you could sort of kind of hack your way into having functions that they didn't their implementation was not inside the struct but the struct gave you access to them or, or something like that it was a hack all right so we're going to say that was kind of our um our cry for help that we needed something new all right so uh, that doesn't that isn't to imply that structs are um, bad and one thing that we might want to remember because you will run into languages that do support structs even today so for instance we might say that java removed structs they decided that a struct was just a class without methods so you could choose in java to write a class and only put fields in there and not have any methods in there right and that sounds like a struct it actually isn't identical we could say this is mostly true but not entirely accurate anybody know why it's not entirely accurate this has to do with um the concept of passed by value versus oh sorry go ahead um no uh, it has to do with the uh the concept of passed by value versus passed by address so if you remember in java objects are passed by address just like arrays are passed by address uh, lists are passed by address in python dictionaries are passed by address when when i say something's passed by address what does that mean go ahead okay so i mean all variables have a spotted memory the difference would be that when you're when you're passing a variable to a function maybe um that variable um if it's passed by address you're passing the memory location of that variable rather than a copy of the value in the example i use in class when we for and we're going to talk about pointers quite a bit probably today actually um but uh uh, I use the example of, you know, the address of my house and you go and spray paint my garage. When I get home, I'm going to be in for a surprise, right? As opposed to if I hand you, if I have two quarters in my pocket or I have, let's say I'm a magician. Okay. Actually, it wouldn't be a magician. Magicians fake it. I'm a wizard. <laughs> so I have a quarter in my pocket. You ask for a quarter. I take it out. I duplicate it, right? I hand you a quarter. Anything you do to the quarter I gave you will have no impact of the quarter I still have in my pocket. That's by, that's passed by value. So if I give you a copy of something and you make a change to it, that doesn't impact the original. If I give you the address where you can find the original value and you make a change to it, that has side effect. Make sense? All right, so Java made this decision that structs, let me see if I can squeeze this in over here. Java made this decision that structs aren't needed in Java um, because they are the same thing as a, you can accomplish the same thing as a struct by writing a class and just choosing not to put methods in there. And we can say that functionally, as long as you're aware of the difference, that's a true statement. But Structs are passed by value. Objects classes are passed by address. Okay, and this is true in, in every language I can, can think of. Any language that has a struct um, in it is passed by uh, uh, value. Now, the difference here is, is if we look at Python, does Python have something that's like a struct? 
We assume the answer is yes. What's it called? Structs are a collection of name value pairs, right? So what do we have in Python that's a name value pair? Dictionaries. Dictionary. But dictionaries are passed by address in Python. So if you pass a dictionary to a function, you make a change to it, that change will have side effect. It's permanent. Okay. So the statement I just made a, a minute ago is still true because they don't call them structs. <laughs> All right. So they don't call them structs. Uh, it's okay. Every language that I can think of, if you have something in it that's called a struct, that thing is passed by value. A copy of it is passed along to functions um, by default. We're going to see here as we start talking about it, uh, like I said, probably today, assuming we get far enough, I'm going to start talking about pointers and the special syntax for it. Um, you can choose to pass a struct by address in a language like C and C++. Um, but if you don't do anything special, it's passed by value. Classes are always passed by address. Okay. Um, so these are structs in C. Java kind of made the decision. Let's just take them out. C sharp, put them back in. Okay. So you can do uh, uh, structs in, uh, in in C sharp. Uh, C++ always had structs because C++ came directly from the lineage of C. Really what it is is C++ is mostly identical to C um, with the addition of a class. Since then, there's been some newer versions of C++, which is why sometimes you'll look up, you'll look up code on Google and you'll find code that used to work but doesn't compile quite right today because now they've introduced things like namespaces and stuff like that. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, in fact, there's a reasonable chance that the compiler shifted a little bit from uh, the last time I've written stuff in C++, and we might have to do a little modification to get it to work this time. But I mean, we're talking tiny little add a keyword here, that kind of stuff. All right. So that's the concept of, uh, of structs. All right. So let's go over and let's start writing a little code in C and then C++ and kind of start experimenting with a couple of different things. I'm going to go ahead and do this in Ubuntu. I know I told you that I was going to do a demo today, I think, of getting uh, Ubuntu on our virtual uh, machine. Um, if you notice here, I do have access to this UWCS network, so we actually could do it. The reason why I'm not going to do it is I was talking to Mark Newhouse and what he's going to do is I guess there's some interference issues with our Wi-Fi hotspot and the university's Wi-Fi that they have around. He's going to add a CUWCS Wi-Fi thing to the university Wi-Fi, which would have access to the stuff in that room. Um, I just want to make sure when I give you the demo and have the video footage of it, it's identical to what you will actually have to do as opposed to what you do today, but maybe not tomorrow type thing. Once you get into that network, it'll be the same, <laughs> but uh, we need to make sure we can get into that network. So um, I'm going to hit the pause button on that. Hopefully, uh, I think he's only going to make it available um, in the proximity of computer science, as well as the uh, makerspace collaboratorium area uh, in the business building. Um, realistically, there isn't a technical reason he can't put it into the dorms. Uh, but he tries to limit the things he puts in the dorms from a security perspective. So we talked about it and I think if I really pushed him on it, he probably would have put it in the dorms. But as a, as a compromise, but potentially just as a compromise, he thought it wasn't the greatest idea. So, you know, it is, it is what it is. But it will be available proximity here as well as in the makerspace. So if you want to go do your homework, you can come here, or you can go to the makerspace, or like I think I mentioned last time, once you get your virtual machine set up, you can put uh, like VNC server on it, uh, which I'll demo when we uh, do the, the demo thing for it. And then as long as that uh, your virtual machine stays running on our machine server, it doesn't shut it down because somebody else needs resources, you would be able to access it from your dorm room through um, uh, VMware's or VNC's cloud. 
this real DNC thing we talked about uh, last time. And then if in the event that it shut down, you would just need to make a little, you know, get some, get your steps in, uh, <laughs> make a, take, a, take a little a tour to computer science, uh, get onto our Wi-Fi, log in to get your virtual machine started back up. Then you can go back to your dorm room and access it through uh, real DNC. Make sense? Okay. Otherwise, if you want more flexibility, install uh, it on a virtual machine on your computer or something like that. I mean, if it were me, that's what I would do if you have a decent enough computer that can run it and all that stuff. But this makes sure that everybody can, can use it. Uh, and even students who are off campus, um, I'm sure we can probably, uh, somebody would be uh, willing to uh, get a server or get a um, uh, a virtual machine set up for you in there and get VNC started for it so you can access it from off uh, campus. If you just needed a, a person physically here, I can do it or another student just put it on Slack if you need that once we get to that point. All right, did I start this guy? Okay, let me turn Ubuntu on. All right. I have two. Oh, it looks like I may be right at the end of class. I started writing this and then we ran out of time. Okay, got it. So we're gonna write, so first of all, we're gonna write a C program. And then we're gonna write the same program in C++. All right, and we'll just see the little differences uh, uh, between the two. I might need to, let me just quickly here, glance at what I had to do before. Yeah, it's, so it's namespace standard, got it. I'm gonna steal that for a second. I'll need it in a, in a minute when I explain this on the, oh, here's CSC 300. So hello world.c. So we're going back to, 1970, something like that when C was kind of the, the, the cool kid language. All right, so we're gonna go ahead. So at the top, similar to in Java, we might need to import some stuff, but Java has the default core Java language automatically imported, where um, C does as well, but, but IO, input output, is not part of that. So we're gonna go ahead and include standard input output dot h that header file all right and so now i'm going to go in here and i'm going to uh, create my main method remember just like in java all programs begin and end with main i think last time we we, we reviewed python that showed our, our template for python programs right which one well let's keep going and let's see if i get the same error all right, so we'll say int main, and then we have int arg c char pointer pointer arg v. Now, did we do, we didn't do any of this last time, right? I think that's something maybe I did in the 450 class to, as a thing. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and we're going to say printf hello world. And if you want to have it kicked out a line, you got to put a backslash n on there. All right, so there is my hello world program. So now let's go ahead and run this guy. So I have this inside of a folder um, CSC 300. So I'm going to open up my terminal here. I'll go into my CSC 300 folder. So this is the default as it puts it in my my home directory. So my home directory on here is home parallel CSC 300. I use parallels and that's the default account it sets up. Um, so inside here. So one thing you're going to want to get used to, and I think uh, um, you should already know a lot of these commands from 200 when you used uh, um, Linux in there is the command line uh, stuff, you know, LS to get a directory listing and that kind of stuff. All right. So here is my. Uh, CSC 300. All right, so there's my hello world.c. Uh, 
to compile this, we're going to use the uh, GNU compiler collection, GCC. So we're going to say GCC, hello world.c. Press enter. Now it's compiled. If I do ls, notice I have a new file in here called a.out. And a.out is an executable file. If I do ls.a, it shows me actually uh, ls. Uh, l, yeah. So notice that for a.out, it shows me that this guy is read write execute for the owner, read and execute for the, uh, uh, the group, and read and execute for everyone. So this is an executable file and hence the reason it's color coded in green uh, with the moving terminal. We're notice that hello world is only read write. That's why it's not. Um, so that's a thing that you edit. This other one is the thing you run. So I'll run dot slash a dot out. So dot slash says look in the current directory. All right. Notice here when I did an ls dash a and it showed all the files in the directory. Um, we had our hello world.c, we had our a dot out, and then we had these two invisible things. Dot refers to the current directory. Dot dot refers to the directory above me. This is something that exists in DOS as well. All right. So if I'm talking about the stuff in the current directory, um, and ultimately what it comes down to is if I just say a dot out here uh, and I press enter, it says the command is not found. And why does it say the command is not found? Whenever you type in a command at the terminal, whether you're on DOS or whether you're on Linux, whatever it is, what it does is it's gonna, you have this, uh, this environmental variable, this environment variable called uh, path. And path is, uh, has a list of semicolon delimited places that it will automatically look when you type in a command. And one of those places is not slash home slash parallels slash CSC 300 slash CSC 300 underscore spring 2021. So one of those directories is not the current directory we're in. So if I want to run something that's in the current directory we're in, I have to give it the full path to it, or I have to give it a relative path to it. And you can accomplish the relative path using that dot. So dot says the current directory slash a dot out. And then when I run that, there's my hello world. All right, that makes sense. That's how we compile and run a C program. Now in here, we're going to be using C++, which is a slightly newer version of C. So let's go and write the equivalent program in C++. So I'll go ahead and I'll create a new file. And we'll save this guy. We'll call this guy hello world.cpp. So instead of .c, it's .cpp. Okay. And we'll do include. And actually, I think I, well, I need to do this part. So include IO stream. Now, historically, we would have said IO stream.h. I'll kind of show you what we would have done historically. I think this will give us an error. And then I would say you can still have it return an int if you want, or you can say void. Um, the reason it would have the historical one, if we look at hello world.c, the reason main wants you to return an int is because back then we didn't have graphical user interface applications. So usually when you ran a command line application, when it finished, you might be interested in whether it worked or not. So that int is the return code. Zero usually meant everything was successful. And then after that, you could have up to, depending on size of int, let's call it uh, 2 billion. You could have 2 billion different possible error codes. Maybe a one means uh, a certain thing failed. A two means something else failed, something like that. So you could have error codes that give you some information about what went wrong. I'm not actually using that here. So I'm not returning a value. If we were in Java, it would scream at me. Java says if you write a function and you advertise that you were going to return a value, you better return it. C did not do that. So we might say in here, if we're being good programmers, maybe the last line in our main is just to say return zero. Everything was a okay. All right, let's go back to the C. So we're going to make our main 
uh, void because we're not intending to return a value here, although you could choose uh, to return a value. If you remember from Java, we say public static void main. So in Java, main doesn't return a value because Java came out um, post uh, uh, graphic user interface applications. And typically Java is meant to not necessarily be run from the command line or at least not from the perspective of giving you an error code using the traditional sense. You would, you would raise exceptions, things like that that are built into Java. So we're gonna say void main and I'll go ahead and write this a little different. So I'm gonna say r int argc and then we're gonna say char array array arg v. Now, if we go back to hello world.c, what are these guys? This is the argument count, the number of command line arguments that were given. And I'll show an example of that here in a second. Argv is an array of strings, the actual values that were given. In fact, I'll go ahead and show this to you right now. So using uh, um, printf, I'll go ahead and say argv at bucket one here. So argc is going to be the number of command line arguments. That will always be at least one. Because in C, it passes along the name of the program as the first command line argument. So if I do two of these, I'll say from command percent s argv at bucket zero. So I'm going to say hello world, and then percent s is a placeholder for a string. And since this is the first placeholder for a string, it'll be filled in with bucket one from our string array. And then I say from com command, I put it in parentheses here, another placeholder. That second placeholder will be the second thing after, uh, second thing at the end here, which will be bucket zero from um, our string array. ArgV stands for argument values. You can name these whatever you want, just like in uh, Java. The variable names don't matter as long as you use them by whatever you call them. Now, if I go back to the terminal, and I run this, I uh, compile this guy again. Now, when I go to run it though, I'm gonna go ahead and give it a command line argument. I'm gonna give it some inputs. And notice here it says, hello world, Mike, from command dot slash a dot out. Go ahead. So when you're running the VCC command, you're just like entirely You need to be in the directory I mean, you either specify the path or you sit in the directory where that file is. If you type in ls, you should see that file sitting there. Well, pwd tells you what the current directory is. If you want to change into a directory, you type cd space the name of the directory. All right. Um, so this is just using uh, uh, using the operating system. So if you want, you can go and do a tutorial for uh, command line interfaces, uh, Linux or something, and spend 20 minutes just uh, refreshing your memory on how to move through the folders and, and things like that. You know, if I want to go up a directory, I do cd space dot dot. That takes me up a directory. If I want to go back into that directory, cd csc 300, blah, 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 takes me back in there. If I type ls, it shows me the stuff that's in the current directory. When I type in GCC, that is already in the path. So uh, this is probably, I'm guessing, in user bin GCC. I can find out if I say which GCC. Yep, so it's in. It tells me it found that in the path and it found it in user bin GCC. These are the binaries that are part of the user space in the operating system. So it already knows about GCC, but I could certainly do user bin GCC hello world dot C dot slash. Well, well, I can 
if I want to be completely explicit about everything, I can do dot slash hello world at C and give it the full path to uh, everything and it'll still work. All right, but, but then when I do, uh, when I run it, a dot out and I pass it my name, bucket one of the argument values is Mike. Bucket zero of the argument values is the name of the uh, file being run. So that's what that arg c and arg v are for. Arg c is the number of things that were passed. Arg v is the values that were passed. Now, why do you think, if we go back in here, if we were looking at hello world in Java, let me just go ahead and create a, So this same line in Java, I'll just put a comment in here is public static void main string array args. So that's the main method for Java, right? Why does Java's main method only take in a single parameter while C as well as C++ takes in two parameters? Based on what you already know, and doing a little uh, looking at the evidence presented on those two lines, what must be different about C? And the same thing's true about C++. Does C not have like arrays in the same way that Java has them? Do I have my volume turned way down? Oh, I do. Say that one more time. Does C not have like arrays in the same way that Java has them? Because instead of passing an array, it passes like what they are and the number that there is. Uh, well, this is an array. I promise that's an array. When we start talking about pointers a little bit more, um, uh, that'll make sense. But the first part of your statement is true. You said, does uh, C not have arrays like Java? Arrays in C behave differently than arrays in Java. Go ahead. Slash. Yeah. Yep. That's the C drive. That's the, yeah. I mean, so what you should do is just go and look up a YouTube video on Linux command line interface, you know, Linux CLI tutorial or something. And that'll teach you the Linux, uh, um, you know, using the uh, directory structure for Linux. Um, so punchline here is, is that this array of strings, that's what that is. That's an array of strings, just like uh, Java takes in an array of strings. The difference is, is that Java, their arrays know how to report their length. So in Java, I can say arg, uh, uh, args dot length, and it will tell me the number of elements in that string array. C does not have that. Arrays in C and C++ have no way of reporting how many elements are in them. So that's why we need that second parameter that tells us the count of elements that were passed. This guy tells me how many buckets are in this array. All right, that's what that guy is for. I have a question. Sure. So does C not have strings like how other like newer languages have them? Uh, they, I think that's an accurate statement. They, they, a C, a, a string in C is a character pointer. It's a pointer to the beginning of a place in memory where a bunch of characters live with a string termination symbol. And we'll look at that. We'll, we'll talk about all that in this class. So strings exist in C. We just kind of have to manually create them instead of there being a special variable type um, that had, well, because classes don't exist, um, having a special variable type that kind of has operations that work on strings. So in C, we have a, uh, a library that knows how to operate on, char or on char pointers, which allows us to do things with, uh, with strings. Um, in C++, default C++ also does not have strings. Now, what ended up happening is kind of in the early-ish days of C++, 
Um, there was a, a library called the Standard Template Library, STL. So as you're, if you're doing Google searching stuff, if you ever see somebody include something called STL, that's the Standard Template Library. And one of the things that is included in that is something called a C string. Um, so what that attempted to do is kind of give us something that's closer to what we expect of strings in, in a more modern language like Java. Um, but I would say it's still not quite the, the same level of, of friendly. Does that make some sense? Yes, thank you. Um, and I think, it, you know, if I was going to take that a step further, uh, last semester when we talked about Java, I probably mentioned something along the lines of I view Java as a string based language. Strings are really, really malleable in, in Java, like very conveniently so. If you have anything in a string format in Java, you can pretty much do anything you want with it, right? You can convert it to all sorts of different stuff. Um, that makes C very convenient, I feel, because we use strings so often. Um, that is certainly not the case with uh, uh, C++ or C. Strings are certainly possible, strings are certainly common, but having something in a string format isn't necessarily as uh, anywhere near as convenient <laughs> as, as having them in string format in, uh, uh, in Java. What's interesting is, is our more, more recent uh, um, programming languages like Swift. I'm very disappointed how Swift handles strings. Strings are nowhere near as friendly in Swift as they are in uh, Java. Um, Java and C Sharp treat strings very similarly. Okay. Yeah, because C Sharp only exists because Microsoft tried to steal Java, got sued, and then had to come up with their own language that looked like Java, but wasn't Java. But I would say since then, C Sharp has evolved into a very strong language that does have some advantages over Java, um, but they're legitimate competitors. So in early days, it was a direct knockoff, but I would say now it's. Yeah, in fact, you could. I mean, the difference. Uh, well, yeah, but I would still make the argument that you can switch between any of them relatively easily as soon as you kind of get the, the basic template down. But to your point, um, you could take a C-sharp program and compile it using a Java compiler and get far fewer errors than you should. Yeah, you don't need to make that many changes. Like instead of system.out.println, it's console.writeline, stuff like that. Um, strings use a lowercase s rather than an uppercase s in C-sharp. Things like that. <laughs> okay. Um, is C-sharp run through a virtual machine like Java is? No, C sharp. Um, I think I did. I not show that that slide. Well, maybe because we don't deal with C sharp directly in here. Uh, if I were to here, let me actually steal it from the four fifty just for time. Why is four fifty just not showing up in there? I have it in here somewhere. Thought I had it in here somewhere. Oh, maybe not. Um, do I have it in five forty eight? Oh, no, we have it in two fifty. That's what we have it on. There we go. There, I'm just going to steal this whole slide. All right, so in Java, which we dealt with last semester, um, well, I'll actually throw C++ in, or C Sharp in here. So when we compile Java, we go from Java source, we compile it, it turns it into Java bytecode, which is a low level language, a one to one relationship with the CPU. So every line of code equals one line of code at the, uh, that the one instruction, one magic trick the CPU understands. 
Then it runs through a Java virtual machine. So a, kind of a computer built out of software, which then we can say pseudo converts it into native assembly code, even though the Java virtual machine is effectively an interpreter that's already running on the computer. So it doesn't actually output assembly code. It just runs on top of the CPU. Um, where if we took C sharp, which is the, this is the funny ha ha joke for the day. So we'll take, so again, this is operating off that knockoff thing. So we take C sharp source code, it gets compiled, it gets turned into missile code, Microsoft intermediate language, which is a low level one-to-one -one <laughs> language, just like Java bytecode. It then runs through something called the .NET component architecture, which then converts it to native assembly code, which then runs on the CPU. Um, so actually what I'll do is just for clarity, I'm gonna say interprets to CPU. So the difference here is we're the same at the beginning. So we have the source code, we compile it, we get into an intermediate language a low level language. Now the real difference here is the Java virtual machine versus the .NET component architecture. So Java's claim to fame was platform independence. You write the program once, it'll run on any platform, right? That the Java virtual machine's on. So since Sun Microsystems, now Oracle, wrote the Java virtual machine for Windows and for Mac and for Linux and so on and so forth, you could run, you could write your Java program once, compile it to Java bytecode and then run that program without recompiling it on any of those platforms because that program is actually running on the Java virtual machine, okay? Which kind of equals a little bit slower because it have, it there, it's having to be interpreted at that last step. You're just converting Java bytecode, a low level language to Intel assembly, a low level language. You're just kind of swapping words, okay? Uh, instead of whole concepts like in a high level language being compiled to a low level language. Where C sharp, this intermediate code runs through the .NET component architecture, which outputs native assembly code. So back in this time period where Microsoft tried to steal Java, got sued, all that jazz. Um, this was when Java's claim to fame was platform independence and people really liked that. They didn't necessarily understand the, the caveats of it because kind of a big deal back then in computing was Oh, if I have a Mac, I can't, I can't even put in a floppy disk that works from a PC. It'll think it's unformatted. Same thing going in the other direction. So the two didn't talk um, to each other very well, which also meant when new software came out, it was typically available only on Windows and the Mac people would scream. Okay. Every now and then there was something that was Mac specific and the Windows people couldn't get it, but they didn't really scream that much. Um, Mac people have always been a lot noisier, even though there's a lot fewer of them. You know, so kind of the squeaky wheel gets greased type situation. Um, so that's kind of the problem Java was maybe one of its motivation, motivating factors for what it was trying to solve was this idea of, uh, oh, we want, to, we want developers to be able to write software once and run it on any platform, rather than having to write a piece of software in C or C++ compile it for uh, Windows, and then have to go and maybe make some changes to the source code so that it'll compile and run on the Mac. So you would have had to rewrite large portions of it for any graphic user interface thing because those two aren't built equally, okay? Um, uh, and that's because when we compile something, so compiling code, So remind me, what's a compiler? What does it do? Converts high level language into something the machine can understand. Yep, so this guy converts high level code to low level code, right? So converts Java to Java bytecode, converts C to, in this case, Intel assembly. Um, but we're gonna say this guy requires two things. The target architecture, so this is like Intel i386 assembly or um, the 
back in the earlier days of Mac, it would have been a power PC risk architecture. Um, for uh, a lot of our mobile phones today, it would be an ARM architecture. So when you think of it, when we talk about the architecture of your computer, and this is something you're probably going to be talking about in the 325 class this semester, what you're really talking about is the, the assembly language, that low level language that your CPU speaks. All right, and you can think about this as just being different languages in, in real life, you know, maybe this computer speaks German, another computer speaks French, and another computer speaks English. Well, if I'm converting my high level program, uh, you know, if I'm compiling it into a low level language, I have to choose, am I going to French or English or German? Make sense? So different processors speak different languages. Now, today, most of our machines are all speaking Intel i386, right? So if my Mac has a core i9 processor in it, which is an Intel. Uh, most of you who are running PCs have an Intel processor in them. Kind of the funny historical thing is that Apple used to run a PowerPC processor, which was not compatible with uh, Intel. Then it switched to Intel, which actually I think was a, a big deal, a positive big deal for them. Had some, there was some transitional uh, problems with that. Uh, but they, you know, it, it was something that needed to happen. It just, there was a delay because they had to emulate your software that worked yesterday when you updated your computer didn't work today because that software is compiled for the old PowerPC architecture. Now you're trying to run it on Intel architecture. Didn't work. So they had to create a virtual machine to allow you to do that. It was called the blue box on um, Mac. Um, but it was kind of the growing pains that were needed to go over to the Intel side. Now, what's kind of funny is historically, we would have said that that was a, a big and a positive move for Apple. That was kind of that start when Apple went from barely surviving as a company to coming back and now being maybe the major tech company or certainly in the top two, right? Maybe Google versus Apple. Microsoft's lost a little bit of its shine, but it's kind of coming back a little bit now. But it's certainly in that conversation of most valuable company in the world type type situation. All right. Um, but what's kind of funny about this is now Apple is moving back towards proprietary architecture. You know, they've been making their own chips for their iPhones and their iPads for several years now with their uh, uh, A1, A2 processors. They just released their latest MacBook Pro, which is only the 13-inch MacBook Pro, which runs a chip called the M1 chip, which is a risk-based architecture, non-Intel. Now, your software that was running on your machine before does still work on it because they do have a converter, kind of like the Java virtual machine that runs it. And most of the performance benchmarks say it, it you don't lose very much speed. So luckily for us right now, people who had a Mac had a previous Mac and then bought the new M1 Mac, their software still runs. Um, but most of that software that's gonna be, that's written for the Mac is gonna start getting written to be compiled specifically for the M1 processor, or the alternative would be to write it using Java. So it'll work on that, uh, on that platform. So this could be a good thing for uh, uh, Java moving forward for business applications. All right, but potentially, uh, potentially, they have to make that decision between how fast does the application need to be. If it needs to um, be platform independent, Java is good. But if it needs to be super, super fast, you're not going to see video games written in Java anytime soon. No, I don't, I, I don't think that's true anymore. I mean, if you're a diehard PC gamer, you're likely on a PC, but that has less to do with the operating system and more to do with the upgradability of the machine, right? If you're a, a PC gamer, you wanna have the latest, greatest, coolest GPU, right? And usually PC gamers aren't gonna be operating on a laptop, they're gonna have their desktop. And even the, the, the Mac Pro, which is their upgradable thing is overpriced and you still can't uh, um, get every GPU, every graphics card for it. So PC gamers, just by default, they don't care that it's running Windows. 
It's more about that they have a tower that they could put the latest, greatest NVIDIA 3090 GPU into or whatever when it comes out. And they're not stuck with whatever they bought on that $4,000 computer two years ago from Apple. That kind of thing. You know, this laptop here has a, a strong GPU uh, in it. Um, it's like a year old, so I can play pretty much any game that's out right now at full frame rate on this, but in two years, I can, yeah, there's nothing I can change, right? Um, uh, but certainly, you know, it, it, when you think Mac, you don't necessarily think gaming machine. Um, but in any case, uh, compilers require two pieces of information. They need to know the target architecture. So what assembly language am I producing? But they also need to know the target operating system. Now, if we go, I know we've looked at this before, but I'm going to switch over to this here. And we're going to say Linux, hello world. You may be, you've probably seen this in multiple classes with me before, but we're going to look through it with a little bit different lens today. Oh, assembly. There you go. So with this lesson in mind that a compiler requires two pieces of information, what's my target architecture and what is the operating system I'm targeting? And the reason for that is when we have an assembly language program um, and that, that's a low level language that has a one-to-one -one relationship with the CPU, um, typically this is hello world in assembly which is more verbose than hello world in Python or Java or C, right? Okay, there's more lines of code uh, and it looks a lot more cryptic, but I'm still telling you that this code right here is still utilizing power tools. It's leveraging the underlying operating system to accomplish the hello world task. If I really was writing this as in pure native assembly, paying no attention to what uh, operating system we were on, I would have hundreds and hundreds of more lines of code. Okay, and let me just walk through this again uh, to remind us how this works. So um, we'll just, down here we've defined a couple of variables. We have a string hello world, and then this guy's the length of hello world, the length of that string. Now, the, the, the important piece here is this guy right here. We have this hardware register. You'll learn about these things in the 325 class. So I won't go into detail there, but we have a memory location on the processor that we're loading the number four into just randomly. It just so happens that that number four coincides with a system call called syswrite that exists on the Linux operating system. Now there's an equivalent to that on Windows, an equivalent to that on Mac, but specifically for Linux, the syswrite system call is system call number four. All right. And system call number four knows how to write stuff out to the screen, but it needs three pieces of information in order to accomplish that. It needs to know where am I writing it? So there's different output streams on operating systems. So one of the output streams is called standard out. On Linux, standard out is the output stream number one. That's where we're writing it to. Then we need to put in here, what am I writing? Then we need to put in here, how long is it? And this has to do with that idea that strings work a little differently in these older languages. You have to know where it begins, the pointer to the beginning of it, and then how many chars are there in there before I'm off the end of that string and I'm talking to other memory, okay? So Linux has a system call a function that requires three parameters. And it's gonna get its three parameters from these specific three memory locations. So in order for the compiler to produce this assembly code, it had to know that you want assembly code in Intel, this is Intel assembly code, but specifically you want my output to be for the Linux operating system, uh, because if you were doing this for Mac or for Windows, your assembly code might look different even if it's Intel still. 
it's using different system calls and possibly they, they take more few, different or fewer or more parameters, whatever it is, but different potentially, All right? That's why we need those two pieces of information when we're using a compiler. What's my target assembly language that you want me to output in? And what operating system are you gonna be running this on so I can take shortcuts if I need to? Otherwise, if we didn't know about the operating system, what would we have had to do here? This syswrite thing, that program, we're gonna presume that the complex program that must do a whole lot of crazy stuff to make stuff ultimately appear on your monitor, we would have had to have the contents of that program written as the output to this uh, program, which would make this executable much, much, much larger when the operating system, it makes sense for, the, for an operating system to already have the ability to write something to the screen. So it might as well just exist once and then we can just call upon it when we need it. That makes sense? That's why we need those two different pieces of information for a compiler. All right, so going back here. So then to finish our little joke up here, C sharp goes from C sharp source code compiled to Microsoft intermediate language, which is a lot like Java bytecode to the .NET component architecture, which then converts the native assembly code for and runs on the CPU. Now, the funny thing there is that back in this time period, the joke was, well, the, the, the Java's claim to fame was platform independence, right? Write it once, run on any platform. Well, in order for Microsoft to effectively create their own version of Java after they got sued, they would have had to be able to say the same thing, right? So Microsoft said, C sharp is platform independent. It will run on any platform as long as it supports the .NET component architecture. Which is written by Microsoft. So to translate that into human, what this really says is C sharp is platform independent. It'll run on any platform, any platform at all, as long as it's Windows. Pick your Windows platform, it'll run on it. <laughs> kind of funny, isn't it? <laughs> now, had they ported .NET, Promoted architecture over to the Mac or over to Linux, uh, then it would have been platform independent. But what's Microsoft's number one product? Maybe Windows? <laughs> uh, how many of you have laptops that are running Windows? Everybody in here who doesn't have a Mac? How many of you have a Mac? How many of you also have Windows on your Mac? Maybe not because you have a separate Windows machine, right? Okay. Uh, well, wh whatever it is, but you, you get what I'm saying. You know, most of you have Windows on your on your machine. Even if you're a Mac user, you also have Windows on your machine, dual booting it or emulating it or whatever. There isn't a whole lot of motivation for Microsoft to allow you to use other people's operating systems. Hence, it's platform independent as long as you're running one of our operating systems. <laughs> Make sense? Can't blame them, right? But there's just kind of a funny, a funny caveat. You know, historically, these companies have done funny things like that. Um, you know, related to operating systems is something we talk about in the, the 450 class. We'll just throw the trivia out there now. Um, you know, Apple's had some well, some pretty funny snafus in the in the past. Um, one of them was uh, when they first released the uh, this is a PowerPC G4 processor. And then they had commercials for two brains are better than one. So they released the, uh, Mac, the Mac Pro that had two G4 processors in it. Physically two processors, kind of the predecessor to a dual core processor. Okay. Two physical processors in it for the same price as the single processor was the day before. 
But now the funny part of that was this. At the time, Macintosh operating system was OS 9. This is before their Unix based operating system that came out, OS X. OS 9 didn't support multiple processors. <laughs> so so they, they, uh, they, they sold you a piece of hardware with commercials talking about how two brains is better than one, yet it was on a machine running their flagship operating system that didn't take advantage of the second processor. There were a couple of software applications like Photoshop that did take advantage of the second processor and certainly Mac OS X took advantage of the second processor, um, but kind of a, <laughs> a funny, uh, a funny zig type thing. All right, so let's finish our little example here of C++ before we run out of time. And then we'll do a little assignment over the uh, weekend for you to kind of catch up on the differences between Java, C, and C++. So short, shortish paper. So for C++, instead of using standard I/O to bring the input output stream or in, input output in, C++ use something called an I/O stream. Okay. Notice it's yelling at me. This complete uh, contains errors. Blah blah blah. Um, I'm going to fix it in a second. I just purposely put it in there. To, this used to work in C++ until they've updated the, uh, uh, the I mean, this was like a, more than a decade ago, they updated the compiler where this no longer worked. All right, so now to use this, we're going to say C out, hello world. I could have done that all on this, so I'll just do it all on a single string. All right, so this is their version of printlin or printf, which is their version of system without that printlin from the, so this is um, the output stream. All right, so the goal here is to have this uh, put hello world out to the screen. So for this guy, I'll just do ls here, make sure we see our file there. There's our hello world.cpp. The compiler for this guy is G++. This is the GNU C++ compiler. And then it's hello world.cpp. Now when I compile this, it tells me, oh, I can't find something called iostream.h. Let's go back into our code. So we're going to include something called iostream like that. But Notice it still doesn't know about this guy. Now I can fix it. I can say standard C out like that, because this is actually something from the C, the standard namespace. Or I can say something like using namespace STD. And then I don't need to say STD C out there. Um, and then this guy, I think, is a char pointer array like that. All right. So can't just say, well, whatever. Let's just get it working since we're almost out of time. You can use, uh, oh. There we go. Little syntax caveats between the two of them. And actually, this might be a char pointer array. <laughs> it's an array of char pointers. We're going to get plenty of practice with uh, pointers there. But now this guy should compile. Oh, notice it's yelling at me that it has to return an int. I thought you could have it return a void, but apparently it still wants you to return an int. And let's just double check while we're at this. I think C++ now might enforce, if you say you're gonna return something, they may enforce that you return it. Let's just see that real quick. No, they didn't. They were cool with us not returning it. But we got another A dot out, and this is our C++ hello world. 
but maybe we say good programming practices. If you've in, if you've advertised, you're going to return something. Go ahead and return the value. We're going to return a zero, saying everything went fine, no problems, because I didn't do any error checking, anyways. So um, there's that. All right, questions about those differences between those guys. And we're gonna have plenty of practice with that. So for our homework, and I'll put this, back, I'll put this up on uh, Blackboard. Let's put it right here. Write a two page paper comparing and contrasting Java, C, and C++. So kind of take the stuff we talked about today, along with some of your own research and create your own little knowledge base of what are the differences between these languages where they're all based on it. Well, they're all based on C, but how have things changed? So I kind of gave you the highlight reel today, um, but do a little research and, and kind of fill in any of those gaps. Um, next class, Tuesday. Yep, and I'll put it on Blackboard. Sound good? Questions, comments, concerns, bribes? All right, everybody have a good weekend. Professor? Yep. Um, I put a question in the chat a while ago and I was just wondering if you could like read it and see if you- oh, Sure. In the future, if you do that, just yell out that you did that or just unmute yourself and yell the question. I did, but it was back when the volume was really low. Oh, I apologize. It's all good. I just figured it out until the end. It wasn't like Anything a super. That you, could, that you could do with the newer language, or does the limitation actually limit you? Um, I would say actually it goes the other direction. There are some things you can do and see that you can't do with some more modern languages um, because of how it gives you direct access to memory. The same thing would be true for C++. So I would say C and C++, because they give you such direct access to system memory, whether you own it or not, allows you to accomplish things. So if you're like a virus writer, you would probably write most of your viruses in C or C++ because of what they let you do to manipulate memory. Where Java hides that from you. And we'll talk more about that when we get into pointers next class and really look digging into them. Um, but really the, the truth is the opposite of your question. It's not that newer languages allow you to accomplish more. It's that newer languages protect you from yourself more. Okay, so structs being replaced by classes isn't like making it, it's just making it like easier, but it's not making it necessarily like better. Well, right. So I mean, really that question is, is, is the, the thing that object oriented languages give you that procedural languages maybe don't. So, you know, C doesn't support classes. So anything, you know, C++ or newer, because they have uh, objects as part of it, sure, they allow you to accomplish things, you know, more of an organizational type thing um, using uh, uh, objects. Not that you couldn't accomplish the same solutions using uh, um, C, it would just be less convenient because you are um, creating them without objects as an available tool for yourself. Okay, thank you. Yep, have a good one. You too.